Mark's my technically stepdad, but really my dad. This is my wonderful stepdad, Randy. Um, it feels like he's been around forever. This is my lovely stepdad of 28 years now. You should say just dad at this point. relationship with my like actual dad so but I met Mark is like oh this is like what a dad is growing up it was just my mom and I I had this fantasy that my parents were gonna get back together when my mom met Randy I just remember my mom would try to get us to act like father and daughter I was not having it I don't need this other person trying to come in and be my dad your pole's all backwards well see when I met Paul 28 years ago, I was a fiery little uh, a brat. You said it, not me. <laughs> That's the stepfather, you, know, you have boundaries, and you know, the relationship like, it develops over time. And I just took things you know, day by day, and you know, we grew as a family. I told your mom when I first met her, I was like, I want this. You know, it took some time, but I suddenly saw Randy in a different light. There's this person right here that loves me and will do anything for me. And then it was like, boom, what are you doing? You have you have someone right there, like right in front of you. Perfect. Thank you. It's one of those things I don't think you ask for, right? Like you're not like, you know, one day I'm gonna be a step <laughs> Watching Victor grow, watching the person that he's become has been amazing. And to know that maybe I've had a little bit of influence on that has been awesome, yeah. I feel. <laughs> <laughs> I think she got the work ethic from me. I do always have a job and pay my bills and... Except the phone bill. <laughs> well, I think parents should always keep you on their phone bill. I do too, because that way I know she'll call us. That's true. <laughs> yeah. Uh, uh, this is uh, kind of a part of this that you didn't really know. I wanted to uh, actually ask you to, um, like, legally adopt me, because I've been using your last name anyways, if you could just like, actually like, legally adopt me, I think it would be like kind of just like a beautiful ceremonial thing, you know what I mean? Absolutely. Yes. I think it'd be... So how do you envision your wedding? Mainly, I want you to be the one to walk me down the aisle. But more than that, um, I was wondering if you adopt me and become my dad for real. father promised that he would do, you actually came through and did. I just wanted to ask you if you would like to adopt me as yours. Does your mom know about this? <laughs> I feel like I'm making up for something that I never had. It feels like I had this family all along and I <coughs> didn't see that I had it. To me, he's always been my father. Powerful video from uh, Budweiser actually. Uh, it's got like almost a half million hits on YouTube. It's unbelievable. A lot of people really um, can relate to what that is all about. I want to open this morning paraphrasing an article written by a Jewish woman. I'm not the only kid in the world who grew up without a father. Truth is, I had one. He just wasn't much. He wasn't around much. When he was, he wasn't particularly interested in dad type things. And although I don't think he intended to be the sort of father he was, I ended up pretty much without one. Something was missing, terribly, but I... I didn't know what it was. Growing up, I used to observe my friends' fathers carefully. There was something more settled and more secure when they were around, and even when they weren't around, the sense of comfort remained. 
my next door neighbor's father was always barking at them to do their chores. And their mother was always threatening to tell their father if they did something wrong. Even though he intimidated me, I envied them. They had discipline, and they learned self-restraint, dignity, and control. Their world was a safer place than mine. When I was 11, my parents separated. And besides the legal person warfare and some financial shifts, my father's moving out of the house didn't have much of an impact on me. It wasn't until a year or so later that I felt the impact. My mother started to date. Not too long after, I acquired something new. Jim. <laughs> Jim was the first guy my mother dated after my dad. Then all of a sudden, a few years later, there, was, there Jim was in my house. With his big feet parked on my mother's coffee table. The sort of drinks he likes in the fridge. My ears, my ears, country music tapes stuffed into the living room stereo. <laughs> the next few years were open warfare. I couldn't stand him. And it's a funny thing, though. Throughout high school, in between the huge blowouts or battles we'd had that lasted for weeks, Jim and I had some sort of a strange friendship. He was like a big pillar stuck by some... Uh, not aesthetically concerned architect in the middle of the room. I didn't much like it, but I had to admit that it was holding up a lot. I resented my friends for liking him, although it wasn't surprising. His sense of humor is like no other, caustic, pointed, and clever beyond words. He has a way of talking to everyone, especially kids, that make them feel comfortable, recognized, and seen. My mother is one of the most overwhelmingly affectionate people on the face of the earth. She can make anyone feel like the most important person in the world. Jim's energy is different. He doesn't overflow with sweetness. To the contrary, his charm is best described as Walter Matthaus. <laughs> but his humor is a force powerful enough that everyone wants to be around him, if only to hear what he might say next. He can hold forth... On pretty much anything, especially when it came to anything Jewish. I inherited my mother's emotional, gut-level ties to Judaism, but I passively imbibed Jim's political tirades, cultural exegesis, and ordinary or ornery rants about whatever issue was on his mind. Our constant battling ensured that I really thought through whatever positions I was taking. Jim made me think. And through his forceful love and loyalty, I saw that a father's fierce devotion is just different than that of a mother's. And that's why kids need both. The truth is, even though we spent a decade or so clashing on and off, I always liked Jim. Of course, when I didn't hate him. <laughs> and by the time we'd all mellowed out, that friendship stayed, as did the respect. Jewish tradition commands us to respect or even fear our mothers, and love our fathers. See, the sages explain that the Torah phrases it that way because it's a natural thing to love your mothers, whereas we need to work on the respect part. But we naturally respect our fathers. Fathers somehow put us on the right course. Sociologist Judith Wallerstein has shown that only half of the boys she followed in a study of divorced families completed college. Some 40% drifted through life out of school and unemployed. In a 1987 study by the University of Michigan, Neil Coulter, PhD, found that girls from divorced families had a harder time developing a sense of being valued as a female. They missed out on the day-to-day -day experience of interacting with a man who was attentive, caring, and loving. Fathers give us a place in the world. The values I used to guide my life come directly from Jim. The way I look at the world comes from Jim. Even whatever sense of humor I have, it's all from Jim. He will always be in my life, always there for me, and I will always respect him and be grateful for all that he gave and taught me. You know, for many that are here today, when we think of a father, 
for a lot of us, it's not our birth father. But it is instead our stepfather. Anybody ever have a stepfather? I had two. I had two stepfathers. For all the men today exiting their responsibilities to the child they have conceived, what are those on the other end of the spectrum who chose the responsibility of loving a child that's not theirs? The men we call stepfathers. Now, as understandably difficult it is for a child to submit to authority and embrace the loving care of a man who has taken daddy's place at the kitchen table. Equally challenging is it for the new husbands to operate in a role as father to children who don't know him much or know him as much to love and raise a child that is not their own. But it's these kinds of fathers and stepfathers that God presents to us as a model of God the Father's unconditional love for his children. It's not an easy job to raise and love somebody unconditionally that's not yours. It's not. There's a song that uh, Michael Carr wrote years ago, a song entitled Joseph's Song. And here's some of the lyrics. Lord, I know he's not my own, not of my flesh, not of my bone. Still, Father, let this baby be the son of my love. Father, show me where I fit into this plan of yours. How can a man be father to the son of God? Lord, for all my life I've been a simple carpenter. How can I raise a king? How can I raise a king? Now, Joseph had maybe a little easier than most stepfathers in this regard only. That he was able to raise his stepchild from birth. However, here's where his ease ends because his stepchild just happens to be the son of God. <laughs> and hard enough to raise a child, imagine a stepchild destined to be the king of kings and the lord of lords. Though a lot of them think they are already. <laughs> well, much is said about Yosef and how he felt about the approaching birth of Yeshua we are told this in Scripture, that he was a man who did things right. I'd like to hear that, wouldn't you? I'd like to be told that I'm a man who does things right. And the manner in which he responded was threefold. He responded with compassion. Men aren't always touchy-feely. Our emotions are in a box. Many of you know that. Men and women are different, if you haven't figured that out by now. George is still working on it. But, but, we, but we are different, George. We're, we're very, very different. We are opposites, innies and outies. That's how I describe it. Let's just get to the chase. We are. We're, 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 we're different, okay? And where a woman, every aspect of her life is always at play at all times, for a man, it's in compartments. And we open one door, we go to that door, we shut the door behind us. So our emotions are, and our feelings, are, and our, such as compassion, are in a little room, a little compartment. And we open that door, and then we shut that door. We go to another door. That's how we operate. That's why we can't multitask very well. <laughs> so the manner that Yosef responded, surprisingly, was with compassion. He also responded with commitment. It tells of his character. And he also responded with consistency. We need that in our fathers, consistency. He responded to his future wife's revelation in these ways, that she was pregnant with compassion, commitment, and consistency. His spirit shows him to be an exemplary father figure, again, the one who does the right thing. So we read in Matthew 18, we're told that Miriam, or verse 18, I should say, Miriam was betrothed to Yosef. Now, betrothal is not language for our modern day, is it? We might call it engagement, right? And we, of course, like everything else that's biblical, we've redefined that as well, according to our own idea of how it should be. But betrothal, our scene, was a great deal more formal than our engagement period is today. It was really kind of a pre-marriage 
relationship. Amen? A pre-marriage relationship. The rabbi would perform a ceremony for the betrothal and the vows would be exchanged. So in essence, when you got married to somebody, you had actually two ceremonies. You had a betrothal ceremony and then you had a wedding ceremony. So that's what betrothal was. Vows would be exchanged in the, before the rabbi. And she would then move into the house of her espoused to learn from her future mother-in-law. During this period of Kiddushim, abstinence was to be maintained until after the official marriage or Nisa'im ceremony. And the Kiddushim period lasted about a year, and if during that period a woman became pregnant, well, it was a big deal, and pretty supernatural, because how she did it under her mother, future mother-in-law's nose, Lord only knows, right? There was, you know, they, they pretty much uh, were in constant contact with family, amen? But, but, but the point I'm trying to make is it was viewed as adultery. And she could be stoned to death, since according to the Arsene vials, they were legally married at that point. Yosef probably thought his life was pretty well on track. Have you ever been in that moment in your life where everything just seems like it's right? Have you ever had that experience? You know, you've, maybe you got out of college, you got that degree, you got the job you hoped for, you, you, you met the man or woman of your dreams, you, you lived in the neighborhood, bought the house you like, you have money in the bank, everybody's healthy, you have wonderful children, and you just sit back and go, I'm a truly blessed individual. Everything's going well. Have you ever had that period in your life? A lot of you have. I've had that period in my life, and I know what that's like. And that's where Yosef was. Everything was right on track. Everything was according to God's plan. His marriage, his vocation were all arranged neatly for him. He was doing all the right things, being faithful to God's ways. That is, until he was informed that his bride-to-be was pregnant. And suddenly, I'm sure, all that he had planned probably seemed like it's what... Blew up. It's gone. And that's probably how he felt. Yosef was a man who wanted to do the right thing according to the Torah, but also a gracious man who wasn't interested in making Miriam a public mockery. Now, where any other man who had been betrothed and discovered his wife had been unfaithful, they would have likely exercised their option and had their wives stoned as the Torah had allowed. Yosef, on the other hand, he used the situation as an opportunity to demonstrate his love for her by being compassionate and deciding instead to provide her a get, fancy word for divorce papers, and divorce her in secret. And we read again in verse, or further in verse 20, which says, while he was thinking about this, an angel appeared to him in a dream, probably a daydream, since Joseph's thinking suggests that he was awake. The angel addressed him as son of David. The angel addressed him as son of David. He's a poor carpenter. He's a man of Torah. And he's from a holy set-apart people. He's Jewish. What's exciting to note is there's only one other person in the scriptures who's called son of David. Any idea who that might be? Yeshua. Yeshua. Right. It's Messiah Yeshua. And yet this is how the angel addresses Yosef, son of David. So I want you to keep this information about Yosef being addressed as son of David in mind, for it's important to us for the rest of the message to understand what the Lord wants to reveal to us today. So he was a man of compassion, but he was also a man of commitment. Hard to find that anymore, isn't it? <laughs> Got a couple of amens in that one. It's hard to find people who are committed to anything anymore, right? Everybody's got one foot out the back door. You know, really, when you think about divorce and abortion and a lot of our issues today, it's really about a foot out. It's like having, a, having an escape clause for everything anymore. There's no commitment anymore. You even talk about contracts. Look at contracts. There's like ways of getting out of contracts. Well, why sign a contract when you tend to get out of it? I always think of what Michael Jordan used to say. You could have made a whole lot more money. He says, I put my word to it. If I sign my name on the contract, I'm going to honor the contract. 
You know, that, he was a man of his word. I respect him for that. It's hard to find that today, you know, the people to honor their commitments. Yosef shared the lineage of King David. The brief portrait of him that we have in Scripture suggests that he was kind of a humble guy. He's quiet, unobtrusive, available when needed, willing to endure hardship and disappointment. Looking forward to fathering his own child, Yosef is now faced with being not a daddy, but a stepdaddy, a stepfather to a child that's not his own. And when the angel of Adonai appeared to him and encouraged him to not be afraid to take Miriam home with you as your wife, for what is conceived in her is from the Ruach HaKodesh, what he did? He went for it. He humbly accepted his circumstances. He took the advice from the angel. I wish we would all take advice from, from God's messengers. And committed to keeping Miriam for his wife. He didn't have any parenting books. I don't recall there's any special church classes on, uh, you know, on, on uh, how to be a stepfather to the Son of God. The rabbis didn't have that class, I don't believe. What he did possess was faith. And what he did possess also with his faith was compassion. So when we look at the book of Hosea, there's a story similar to the one that we're telling right here. Yosef, when Yosef is asked to take as his wife a woman who he thought might have committed adultery, Hosea is asked to take as his wife an adulteress. The other day reading this, I was amused by the directness of God's opening words in Hosea 1 verse 2. <clears throat> Go marry a whore and have children with the whore, for the land is engaged in flagrant whoring, whoring away from God. So I got a feeling he's trying to get a message here about hoarding, I guess. By Hosea taking the whore Gomer as his wife, this represented the Lord being wed to an unfaithful people. He got married to an unfaithful people. Israel continually strayed from the Lord. You can read over and over in Scripture the unfaithfulness of Israel. But God was committed to his people, and it is to this day. The Lord loved Israel enough to save her by his grace and take her back. And take her back he will, because they continue to stray from him. Again, as I told you so many times, you see all the little, everybody runs off to the Holy Land to see all the sights. And we see all the, the pretty pictures of, you know, all the holy, you know, the, the, the Hasidim, the Hasidic Jews and the, the very religious Jews and all that takes place there. But the fact remains, Israel is number one in every, every area of decadence in the world. They're number one in murder, number one in adultery, number one in divorce, number one in drug abuse, number one in prostitution, number one. You, you, name, you name any area of decadence, and Israel is number one in it. So, but God is still committed to his unfaithful bride. Every time Hosea's wife, Gomer, cheated on him, he loved her enough to save her from the consequences of her actions and take her back into his arms. So when Yosef suspected Miriam's infidelity, what did he do? He loved her. He loved her unconditionally and saved her from paying the penalty and took her to be his wife. See, Yosef, the son of David, was demonstrating salvation, brothers and sisters. That's salvation. When he was moved with compassion, he sustained his commitment and took Miriam to be his wife, even when he suspected her of being guilty. And in doing this, he was an example of the type of character that his stepson Yeshua would have. Yeshua, the son of David, would not only show unconditional love, but he would be unconditional love. He would be it. And he would be salvation incarnate. Now, God the Father was using stepfather Yosef to reveal the nature of his son, Yeshua, to model the person of Yeshua. Brothers and sisters, the Lord wants us to know right at the beginning of the apostolic writings that through Yeshua, there is forgiveness. There is forgiveness. That through Yeshua HaMashiach, we will receive unconditional love and forgiveness and be forgiven of any sins that we are guilty of. And sins many of you are in the midst of right now. Many of you are in right now. 
It's been said, the best thing a father can do for his kids, you know what that is? What's the best thing a father can do for his kids? Any thoughts? Love their mother. Love their mother, wise woman. Love their mother. Yosef's love for Miriam reflected by Rabbi Shaul's definition. Love is patient and kind. Not jealous, not boastful, not proud, rude or selfish, not easily angered, and it keeps no record of wrongs. Love does not gloat over other person's sins, but takes its delight in the truth. Love always bears up, always trusts, always hopes, always endures. Amen. My wife told my son the other day, she said, you know what? I have to tell you, women are crazy. And I know it. I'm crazy sometimes too. I have hormones. I'm crazy. I get it. But you know what? Even when she acts crazy, I still love her unconditionally. Right? Even when you guys want the air conditioning on, I still love you all. <laughs> Just joking. But instead of being indignant, Yosef accepted this child as his own. He was the ideal stepfather, loving his wife and stepson unconditionally. Some of you may remember years ago, James Dobson, he said this, Mothers determine the emotional nature of a family, but fathers determine the spiritual nature. Boy, have we dropped the ball on that as a culture in the world, have we not? <clears throat> but you know, my wife made a good point when she was standing up here, in that we are truly blessed with godly men here. We really are. Yes. We truly are. There, there is a, and Zahin Lindstrom has brought that up many times. You know, they say that one of the signs of a healthy congregation, one of the signs is lots of children. Amen. The other sign is, is lots of men. Lots of men. And that's a blessing. We are very, very blessed with all, with men that really, for all intents and purposes, in one dimension or another, serve as Shamashim. Some more so than others, but all have a heart to serve, all have a heart to give, all have a heart to model the truth of Yeshua, or at least the best to seek the truth of Yeshua, hopefully applying it. But that applied for Yosef as well. Day in and day out, he was committed to being a good model for his young son by doing the right thing. By settling or setting, I should say, the spiritual standard and tone for the home through his faithful observance. And Yosef was a faithful man. He was willing to follow God's will in a way. For today, even though tomorrow was unclear, but for the here and now, he was going to do the Lord's will, without question. Yosef modeled for all of us how to live by faith in difficult and really uncertain times. It's easy, you know, if you were to stand for God's will and way in these days, you're not well received anymore today. You're really not. If you drift outside the boundaries of political correctness into God's will and way, you will be chastised for it. And it's no different now than it was then. Living by faith is difficult. Living by faith in uncertain times, it's not an easy thing to do. But because of Yosef's example, we are challenged and commanded to do likewise. And men, this world has to see us do that. We have to not water it down, but stand graciously, and I should say compassionately and graciously, on truth. We don't do anybody any favors by compromising the truth. We don't do any buddy any favors in regard to their, their future salvation by watering it down so it fits, you know, modern vernacular and uh, belief. We don't do them any help at all whatsoever. Even though you know that what you're about, to, what you believe or how you live your life will be mocked or belittled. We have to show courage. We have to show strength. A quiet strength. Not an aggressive lordship kind of strength, but 
kind of strength that is loving and compassionate, but still steadfast in our convictions, not being moved. Yosef represents the type of father on earth that God is in heaven. And that's a high praise for this man. Yeshua teaches us that we are to look to God as our father. Yosef showed young Yeshua the kind of love that comes from God. He shows us the kind of love God has for all his people, particularly those who are the least. And he risks everything to make sure his son is safe. Yosef was not the earthly father of Yeshua. We know that. But he showed to each of us the sort of love that God wants us all to have for each other. And the irony of it here is, <laughs> this is like the, the, the deepest irony, if you think about it. But the perfect man was not raised in a perfect family. The perfect man was not raised in a perfect family. So don't beat yourself up if you don't have the perfect family. Don't beat yourself up if you're adopted or you have a step parent. Because the perfect man was raised by a stepfather. It's amazing love if you think about it. Because a father, a stepfather or even mother, stepmother's love, uh, of course, is a choice. It's not by default. You don't suddenly have a child and you just love the child because it's your blood. You choose to love. Just like Yeshua chose to love you. Just like, you know, we choose to love our mates, whoever that may be. It's amazing that he still chooses you when you are guilty and loves you unconditionally. I don't know that I've ever experienced unconditional love in this world. I don't think any of us really have. We want to believe that we love unconditionally, but the fact remains there's going to be conditions somewhere. And we don't want to say that of ourselves, but we have it in Yeshua. He does love you unconditionally, without a doubt. How would you feel if you were Miriam? And people thought you committed adultery. Nothing's worse, brothers and sisters, than being accused of something you didn't do. Let me just tell you, that's the worst. And especially something as heinous in that culture today, especially as adultery. Here it's celebrated in our day. But then it was a serious issue, even to the, the point of costing a young lady her life. How would you feel then, knowing that, that you've been accused of this, some, that somebody would step in and rescue you from being killed? That would take it, the heat for you. You would probably feel a sense of love that you've never experienced before in your entire life. What would you say if I told you that you could experience this type of love? That this could be a reality in your life? Romans 6.23 says, and you all have it memorized, the wages of sin is death. And 3.23 says, for all have sinned and fallen short of the glory of God. All people, all of us, are in a very similar situation as Miriam. Though ours is different in that we are truly guilty, she wasn't. See, brothers and sisters, as we transition into tomorrow's Father's Day celebration, where men will be sitting around with remotes and hands, some may be buying them tools or whatever, because that's all we like is remote controls and tools, apparently. <laughs> And uh, as we transition into this, this day where we remember fathers, God the Father, know this, that God the Father loves you unconditionally and is ready to accept you as his own. And here's the, the great part about it. He has a plan of adoption, just like in the video. He has a plan as well of adoption for whoever receives the saving love of Yeshua. There is someone who will step up and save us from being killed. There is a perfect son who has chosen you and will love you unconditionally. And he is the son of David and the stepson of Yosef. He is Yeshua. Please rise.
Father, as we bow our heads before you, we acknowledge that as much as we try in our flesh to love unconditionally, we will fall short. Because in the end, Father, there's nothing we love more than ourselves. We'll say that we love our wives and our husbands. We'll say we love our children. We'll say we love you, Yeshua. We'll say we'll love your way, your truth. We want your life. But in the end, the flesh wins out. We're so thankful, Father, that knowing this, you still, in our spiritual whoring, you still love us unconditionally. That Yeshua was willing to step in our place and, Father, to, to suffer death on our behalf. And Father, we are truly, we should be receiving. But by your grace, Father, we have not received the eternal death. But we will live. And we will come to a day, Father, after we are judged, that we will truly realize what has taken place and how truly blessed we are. So, Father, forgive us for taking for granted, Lord, a Yosef like love that is a chosen love, the love that is unconditional, the love that is selfless. Thank you, Father. Forgive us for our flesh. Forgive us for compromising your way. Forgive us for not stepping up like Yosef did in our own world, in our own day. Perhaps, Father, it's not too late. Perhaps, Lord, maybe this message will inspire some of us. Maybe, Father, will inspire somebody outside of our doors. But nonetheless, may we be forever reminded, Father, of what true love looks like. We've seen it in Yeshua, and Father, we see a lot of it in Yosef. Blessings upon all stepfathers, Father. And thank you, Lord, for giving us an example of which to live by, Yeshua. In his name we pray. Amen. Amen. <laughs> The Lord bless you and keep you. The Lord make his face to shine upon you, gracious unto you. And I pray the Lord will lift his countenance upon you, his favor, his love, his peace. Hashem Yeshua Adonai. And the congregation agrees? Amen. Amen. Well, no weapon formed against you.